Okay, so I wanted to make a video about string theory and I wanted to start with the obvious question, what is string theory? Because that's a sensible and straightforward question, right? Well, turns out that's not so easy to answer because it can mean different things. And it has meant a lot of other different things over time. Like anyone else in their 40s, string theory went through a lot of phases. I dug into the history of string theory and I figured I can do a short historical introduction for my string video. I started writing that and dug a little more and then looked at what I've got and figured, okay, this is way too long. But it could be an interesting video by itself. And here we are, Hollywood magic. To guide us through this adventure without getting lost, I have created this timeline of string theory, which will take us from humble beginnings as a theory of the strong interaction, to quantum gravity, to a hopeful theory of everything, to fraying into an overarching mathematical toolkit, where we kinda are today. So let's begin at the begin, shall we? The story of string theory starts in 1968, in a time before there was a standard model. Physicists had successfully formulated quantum electrodynamics, but were struggling with building a model for the strong and the weak interaction. At this time, a physicist at CERN, Gabriele Veneziano, came up with his dual resonance model to describe scattering of particles under the influence of the strong force. This paper is now regarded as the first string theory publication, even though it had no strings in it whatsoever. It was purely a method to compute scattering amplitudes, i.e. what happens when you fire two particles at each other and they have a strong interaction. It was a neat method and it was very useful for calculating some particular results. A few years later, people figured out that if you start with relativistic one-dimensional quantum objects, i.e. strings, their oscillations can manifest as different particles with different energies. And also you can directly derive the Veneziano model from this. So Veneziano had first found the application of this theory and people only later found out that all of this followed from just describing particles as strings. That is the basic premise of string theory and that's also where the name comes from. One foreshadowing result of this early string theory was that you needed extra dimensions to make the theory consistent. It would not work mathematically in the three space plus one time dimensions that we can observe. But alas, in the early 70s, the model was contradicted by new collider experiments and quantum chromodynamics won out as the best description of the strong interaction. And soon, this would become part of the standard model. String theory had failed as a description of the strong force. But wait, the mathematical structure and formalism alone were interesting enough so that some people just kept working on it. They thought that this could certainly be an answer. It has just been applied to the wrong question. Well, Apart from not fitting the experimental evidence, early string theory also had some theoretical shortcomings. It predicted tachyons, particles moving faster than light, in contradiction to relativity and observation, and also causing instabilities in the math. Fundamentally, there are two types of particles that we observe in the universe, and these are called bosons and fermions. As string theory only described bosons, it was obviously missing something. It also predicted a massless particle with spin 2 that people didn't know what to do with. The theory demanded 26 dimensions, obviously way more than we can observe. There was a big change in 1971 when Ramon, Neveu and Schwartz introduced supersymmetry into string theory, turning it into superstring theory. Supersymmetry is a mathematical concept that posits a symmetry between bosons and fermions, in that there exists a fermionic twin particle for each boson and vice versa. 
Note that this is a purely theoretical prediction. We haven't found any such supersymmetric partner particles anywhere yet. To this day. But physicists just love symmetry and also the consequences of introducing supersymmetry were looking really good. This removed the tachyons and all related instabilities. It introduced fermions into the theory and it also reduced the critical dimension from 26 down to 10, which is still more than the four dimensions that we can observe, but still, that's at least closer to reality. In 1974, people could finally identify this mysterious spin-2 particle with the graviton, and they could also show that its behavior was consistent with general relativity. What this means is that this particle that nobody had asked for, it just popped up in the theory by itself, looked very much like a quantum field particle for gravity. This was another huge directional shift in the history of string theory. It was now seen as a candidate for quantum gravity, the unification of quantum theory and general relativity. By this time, the standard model of particle physics was being finalized, so there already was a quantum theory for every interaction that we know, except for gravity. Combining quantum physics and gravity has been tried a lot at this time, but it had proven stubbornly impossible to find a theory that wasn't full of infinities and irregularities. Nothing seemed to work. But wait. String theory looked like it had all the ingredients to be a successful theory of gravity. If only it could avoid all those instabilities and irregularities that plagued all the other theories. Until this point in our story, string theory had been a promising but still niche theory of quantum gravity. But then the big bomb went off in an event that would later be called the Superstring Revolution. In 1984, Green and Schwartz successfully showed that in superstring theory, all the usual terms summing up to infinity also exist, but there were additional terms that would exactly cancel them out. String theory was finite. And not just that, it was the only known theory of quantum gravity that was finite. And even if you're not a mathematician and you don't fully understand what this infinity stuff means, you get that this is a huge deal. This cancelling of terms is related to string theory describing particles as vibrations of one-dimensional string and not as a point particle. This discovery was like a beacon for all other physicists, showing them that there might be a theory that could unify the quantum world with gravity, and this theory was called string theory. The field was catapulted into mainstream popularity am amongst physicists, and also sparkled a lot of interest in the actual mainstream through books like A Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking and uh, Michio Kaku's early books when he was still a serious scientist. Anyway, if you're a normie, a non-physicist, and you have heard anything about string theory, then that's exactly the version people have been talking about. People have also done more work on the additional dimension problem, and the basic idea here has always been that these additional dimensions were small or compactified. You can understand the basic concept like this. Think of a hair. It is very thin, so it looks like a one-dimensional object. Only when you examine it very closely, you realize it is uh, 3D. Or a sheet of paper looks like a 2D object, but on closer inspection it is 3D, etc. The mathematical basics of compactification had already been done by Kalusa and Klein decades ago. But now, by using the so-called Calabi-Yau geometries, there was a solid mathematical formulation of compactifying the 10 dimensions down to 4 dimensions and getting something that looks very similar to our existing physics. A lot of additional people were flooding into string theory at this point and one of the consequences was that soon string theory was found to be non-unique, meaning there were a number of different string theories. Eventually, five variants were defined. Type 1, Type 2a and 2b, SO32 heterotic and E8 by E8 heterotic. This was addressed in 1995 by what was called the second superstring revolution, 
in a talk by Ed Witten. He could show that all these 10-dimensional theories were not independent, but related and connected by dualities. These relations also included 11-dimensional supergravity that had been developed independently of string theory. At this point, let's take a step back. Uh, the point here isn't all the funny names, but that all of them are related. Witten made the point that all these different string theories weren't separate, but rather special cases of one even more fundamental 11-dimensional theory he called M-theory. Without saying what the M was supposed to be. One other important part of this era of string theory is the introduction of brains. Meaning the idea of a string was generalized to higher dimensions like 2D surfaces, etc. So string theory seemed to be moving towards an actually working theory of everything during the late 80s and early 90s. At this time, it blew up like AI in 2023. But wait, what happened in the late 90s? The most important finding in the late 90s was something later called the landscape. Basically, people look deeper into the compactification of 10 dimensions down to the 4 dimensions we observe and found a large number of ways to do this. And the deeper they looked into it, the larger the number grew until it was basically infinite. The number often quoted here is 10 to the 500, even though this is just based on an approximation. Again, basically infinite. The biggest draw of string theory had always been its uniqueness, meaning the theory worked in exactly one way and one way only. There were no parameters to tune, there were no alternatives. And whenever alternatives were found, like the five types of string theory, soon a deeper principle was found that unified the problem back to being unique. It had looked like string theory was a unique, distinct theory of everything that there was exactly one way to mathematically describe the universe. This idea had carried string theory to the forefront of theoretical physics, but this idea was now dead. String theory no longer predicted a singular, unique universe, but an infinite number of possible universes. The theory of everything had become a theory of anything. People did find some ways around this, like the anthropic principle and the multiverse, but none of these solutions were especially appealing. Certainly not as appealing as a unique mathematical description of the universe. So, since the early 2000s, the hype has cooled off a lot. Many people moved out of the field and it has become more niche again. Today, String theory is seen more as a framework of mathematics that originated in the earlier string theories and that is now applied to other fields in math and physics. And this concludes the history of string theory. In the next video, I will look more into the meaning behind the theory and also the criticisms of the theory and whether the current period of cooling down really means that string theory has failed. So. See you next week.